Verily, verily. It's in the Bible many times. That word means truly. Truly, truly. So that's the title of my message, and you'll understand in a moment why. That's a great significance when God says something twice. Um, it's be like me saying, babe, babe! Or, James, James! Boom, it's emphasis. There's something about that verily, verily, that God is really trying to get through to people. And he does it seven times to people's names in the Bible. It's not adult Sunday school, so I won't ask you who they are, but it's Abraham, Abraham. Mm -hmm. Don't sacrifice your son. That's when he said it, at that time. I am your supplier. Jacob, Jacob. Moses, Moses, at the burning bush. Samuel, Samuel, as a little kid, he said his name twice. Young people can hear the Lord's voice, but it's going to be rare, and it's going to be life-changing, and it's going to be powerful. Otherwise, I don't think that kid did go see heaven in all those movies. So why aren't they on fire right now preaching all over the place? Okay? Samuel, Samuel. Martha, Martha. Go to Luke chapter 10, verse 38. We'll look at Martha, Martha. This is a rabbit trail. Not my message. But what needs to be preached. Luke 10, 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Oh, she sat at Jesus' feet. Where did she learn that from? Oh, maybe uh, Ruth <laughs> went and sat at Boaz's feet. Okay. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, Dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Can you say bossy? Oh, feminism in the New Testament. Feminism there before the covenant change era. Right? It's still there today. But tell her what to do for me. And, of course, Jesus has the rebukes of all rebukes. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Okay, it's not a compliment, Mark. That's the only one on the list of the you know, of Jacob, Moses, Abraham, Saul, Saul, Simon, Simon. Those are the other two. Martha, Martha. It's a rebuke. Thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. And your sacrifices and your works shall be probably taken away. And I'm pretty sure Martha received a rebuke and started to listen to Jesus. So if you're thinking about what you're cooking this afternoon right now in the sermon, you are a Martha. If you're thinking about your to-do list tomorrow morning, you are a Martha. And you need to meditate on these words of Jesus. One thing is needful, and Mary chose the better thing. I know we're busy. You still make time to pray in the morning. Still make time to read your Bible. One thing is needful for you women. Don't be a Martha. So, what struck me a few weeks back when I was reading the words of Jesus is the times he said, verily, verily, truly, truly. I thought that'd make a good sermon. And surprisingly, all of them are in the book of John. <laughs> Not once in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. He never, he never says, verily, verily. I was like, wow, there's some theory why, but I don't know why. I'll pray it. I'll th seek it out. You don't have to know all the answers why. You know, John, John was the last gospel. John is a very powerful gospel. A very deep gospel, and it's where all the verily verilys are at. So let's start off at John chapter 1. And I didn't number them, but if I did, I'm guessing it's 9, 10, or 11 times or so. And I didn't cover them all, by the way. I, I, I skipped a few for the sake of time. John 1, 51. And some of these I go right to the verily verily, and some of these I go the verse to the fourth. Jesus answered and said unto him, and to Nathanael, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And later Nathanael did see that. He did see that. It was all called the Ascension Day, the Day of Ascension. On the Mount of Olives, Jesus, the angels came down, Jesus ascended up, the angels talked to him, the angels ascended up. He saw them happening that day, like Jacob's dream. Jacob had a dream, and he saw the angels going up and down the ladder, 
And Jacob said, wow, this is the house of God. And he built an altar there and he called it Bethel, the house of God. So the 120 on the day of the ascension were the living stones. They were the house of God. They were the church. They were the start of the church right then and there. Um, and uh, this promise is not only to Nathaniel, which it is primarily, that is the interpretation, but it has multiple applications. You will also see mighty things, mighty signs from God over time if you stay in the house of God, if you stay connected to the vine, Jesus Christ, and to his house, to his body. Next, John chapter 3, verse 1. We all know this, but it's a couple of those times at the very least there, because it's truly important. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So there it is. Truly, truly, you will not see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And the key word there is see. If you don't have an underline in your Bible, you want to underline that. Because it doesn't say enter. It doesn't say enter. Many people are born again that are not saved. They're touched by the Spirit of God. Their heart starts changing. They start seeking the things of God. It's a powerful thing. It's a good thing. It's step one. But if they died in that state right then and there, they don't go to heaven. They're seeing things. Is that you? Verse 4 and 5. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time to his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I'm telling you this. I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. And that's that keyword, enter. So yeah, water baptism is part of salvation. Without water baptism, you will not enter. It is access to the blood of Jesus. It's not the blood of Jesus. You need access to the blood of Jesus. Repentance, faith, baptism. And you get the blood of Jesus, and you get sealed with the Holy Spirit. So he says you must be able to be verily, verily. It's very important. There's only a few times he says truly, truly. Verily, verily. And this is one of those times. John chapter 5, verse 19. I made a whole message on that before, so I won't revisit it now. But it, it's it's um, many scriptures about baptism. Very important. John 5, 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Jesus is God. Everyone say nothing. 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 <laughs> say it again. Say nothing. 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 You can do nothing that's truly fruitful. Fruitful. Without God. Street preach. Raise your kids right. Be an obedient wife. Be a godly husband. Be a good example of a father. Lay hands on the sick. Preach. You can do nothing of true fruit without God. You have to stay fully dependent upon the Lord. And I know, I know, your willpower is strong. I know. I know it is. Look where I got you before. It's not strong enough. Willpower is not strong enough. And if your willpower bears fruit, it'll be bad fruit. If your self-will bears fruit, it will be bad fruit. Look at every mega church around today. Self-will can bear some fruit, but it's going to be bad fruit because it's not dependent upon God. And I have no problem saying I'm dependent upon God because I am. Absolutely. That's, that's it's a fact. 524. Uh, I'll go back to go back to 22 because it's just more about Jesus as God. It's a good anti-Islam message, 22, 23. For the Father judges to no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Pretty clear Jesus is God. He came down in the flesh, manifest in the flesh. Emmanuel. 
that all men should honor the Father even as they, all, excuse me, all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Clear cut. One judgment throne in heaven, not three. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, hath, that's a present tense word, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So he has two verily, verilys right in a row, 24 and 25. And the first one, he's saying, you have to hear and believe. So if God closes your ears, you can't hear. If you love the lie more than truth, or you're going to get your ears closed by God. And he says, hear, and then you need to believe. There's a sin called unbelief. Unbelief sin is a major sin. Unbelief is why Adam and Eve fell. Unbelief is an insult to God. Uh, I might do a whole sermon on called the, the sin of unbelief. It's bigger and deeper than I thought. Been studying that. And, he, and uh, there's a lot of scriptures. I don't want to get off sidetracked on that. Uh, he that believes on him hath everlasting life. Hath. Hath. And is passed from death unto life is past. See, if you have everlasting life, then you're not afraid if you're a martyr for the Lord, if you're put to death for the Lord. You're not afraid of street preaching say, I'm going to kill you. Say, well, what are you waiting for? I go to heaven. Oh, that's right. You're afraid of the cops. Yeah. It is past from death into life. We walk around with eternal life in us because the Lord Jesus lives in us. And it's a good feeling. That's what gives you peace. It's what gives you a clean conscience. And this what takes away the sting of death is passed from death to life. So it is present tense. It is reality. And 25, when uh, the, the hour is coming, and now is, it's present, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So there, um, he's talking about the spiritually dead. Okay, he's not, he's now, when he, when he comes back, all the dead are going to look up and see him. They're going to see him from hell, the grave, they're going to be raised. You know, but here he's talking about the spiritually dead. The spiritually dead people start to hear the voice of God. And it starts to resonate with their heart, with what they know is righteous, and their conviction. And then those that hear, they shall live. And so he's teaching deep spiritual things. This is, you know, for a young Christian, but this is also for a pastor of seven years. This is, this is for a man who's maybe been saved 30, 40 years. These are deep words. These are things you can meditate on for a long time. They're going to hear it. They're going to live. He knew he was talking to spiritually dead people. We are talking to spiritually dead people out there. John chapter 6, verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. So really, not much a comment here. <laughs> Even a child can understand what God's saying here about why people, why some of the people follow Jesus. I, I, I could ask one of the kids in the church, and they well, yeah, it says it right there. It's so simple. The real question is, why do you follow Jesus? Because he healed you? So that's why you follow him? Because he healed you? Because he, he gave you provision? Because he gave you a spouse? Because he gave you kids? Because he took away the mouse? <laughs> Okay, I had to rhyme with spouse. <laughs> why, why do you follow Jesus? That's the real question. Jesus knows why you follow him or not. He knew why Judas followed him or not. He knows your heart. So be honest with the Lord. Verse 32, same chapter. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Oh, sorry, I'm at 33. 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life into the world. Yeah, he says, Moses didn't give it, because I, I gave it. You know, I gave it to you, and I'm giving myself now as the bread. I, she, she doesn't bother me. <laughs> you can come all the way to the pulpit, I'll just turn around and send her right back. <laughs> Uh, go to 47. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So you want, he wants the seven-year-olds to get it. He's given it nice and simple there. You believe on me, you have life. And then he gives it to the deep theologian on all of chapter 14, 15, 16, 17. You can go into those for years. Okay? And um, the one that believes also is the one that, that, that obeys. If, if, you, if you really believed, you would obey too. Because of the warnings about belief and unbelief, you would obey also. Um, 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. So clear cut. Everyone must be part of a local church. Mm -hmm. Just a matter of time when they get connected. Not salvation uh, initiation, not for the initiation of salvation, but afterwards, later on. Okay? Um, quick story. Uh, there is a, a street preacher in Canada who... Um, you, you, left the military because uh, he wouldn't take the vaccine. This was like three years ago. And uh, he listened to some sermons, asked me some questions. Like a lot of these guys that call or email, answer and then the guy backslides and disappears, just gone. So he, he emails me like a week ago, says, hey, pastor, I'm sorry. I backslid, blah, blah, blah. I remember you, you're still out there. Go, man, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. I'll, I'll preach if it's just my wife. Okay, I'm not gonna stop preaching. And uh, he said he was, you know, he's, he's serving the Lord now, and he's you know, part of this new local church. Remember, he's in Canada, and his new church is in America. So I email him, and I say, how can you take communion? Can you do it by Zoom? Is there a Zoom communion? Do I, did I miss some new thing? Does it, does it transfer through the airwaves? Can you, do, can you do communion by phone? How do you explain John chapter 6, verse 53? How do you answer that? So he might have already emailed me this morning. I don't know. He emailed back. And who's authorized to give communion? And why can they give communion? Why can a kid give communion? And what does excommunication work? Is the word communion inside the word excommunicate? If you excommunicate someone, what are they cut off from? Mm -hmm. The Bible says from the Lord's table. The Bible says from the community. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they're going to infect the kids. That's why. They might wait five years to infect the kids, but they will. Most of the time, they only wait about five minutes. <laughs> okay? A real patient devil's wait five years. Go to chapter 8, verse 34. So be praying for him. His name's Andre. We pray for lots of these guys. We pray for the Joeys out there. We pray for the Wesses out there. We even pray for the Dean Saxons. We pray, we pray for them. We pray that God kills reprobate preachers and God saves backslidden preachers. Absolutely. 834. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Clear cut. You are a slave to the sin you commit. Slave. See, there's a small, and I want to make sure you understand this, church. There is a small side benefit of the Daniel fast. That's it, okay. Side benefit of the Daniel fast. It's not uh, the main purpose of the Daniel fast. Okay? And that side benefit is what are you just absolutely, like, dying to eat? <laughs> You're just like, ah! Just want that so much. That steak or that uh, big uh, juicy piece of uh, German chocolate cake or vanilla Jeez. pie or, or I don't know. I'm trying to, or vanilla ice cream or strawberry ice cream. I don't know what y'all's favorite desserts are. Okay, cherry cobbler. We can just go on and on with this list. Okay? So it's breaking it. Daniel Fast is breaking these things off of you and that's a good thing. Not, it's not, it's not sin to eat a steak. It's not sin to eat the German chocolate pie. Okay? Uh, but it's very good to put down your flesh. Because if you didn't learn to put down your flesh now, when will you ever learn to put it down? Mm -hmm. When do the kids start the Daniel Fast? Young in this church. Okay? When do they learn to put down the flesh? How are you going to honor your father and mother if you don't honor Father God? Okay? Mm -hmm. And so... Let's do a little rabbit trail. On, on, uh, keep your finger there, John. Go to Isaiah, Isaiah 58. We are going to study true and false fasting. I taught on this three or four years ago when we did a three-day water-only fast. But we are leaky vessels. Say amen. amen. If you agree we are leaky vessels, say amen. Amen. Okay. That's the way I need to phrase it. I don't want to just tell you to say amen. <laughs> 
What do they mean? Do you agree with leaky vessels? So Isaiah 58, we're going to go from 3 to 12. Uh, Wherefore have you fasted, say they, and, seest, uh, and thou seest not? Wherefore, ye have, uh, wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Sh ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? Uh, no, not the one those Pharisees were doing. Not that one. A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Now he's going to list what he calls as fast. To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. You have a yoke of addiction to meat, to, to uh, chocolate, whatever, to break these yokes. This is the fast he's chosen, to break those yokes. And then it leads, of course, to breaking spiritual yokes off of, off of people through the preaching. Is, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked? that thou cover him, and that thou shalt not hide thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. Then, this is some of these benefits that come after the real fasting, then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Hear, I am, if thou wilt take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the pointing forth of the finger, and speaking vanity. I'm silent. That doesn't mean point out sinners on the street and their sin, okay? That doesn't mean not pointing of the finger. Verse 10. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. Amen. That's a lot of light. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. Oh yeah, finish your fasting, finish your prayer and fasting. And they, shall, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, they shall rise up, raise up the foundations of many generations. Think of your kids and your grandkids. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. And then he goes on to talk about the Sabbath. Wouldn't that be a great legacy to have, man? He was known as the repairer of the breach, <laughs> the restorer of the old paths. And when you study the old paths, and then you understand why our church does certain things that we do. We want to be a restorer of the old paths to dwell in for many generations. All right, going back to John. So prayer and fasting will help to put down sin, but ultimately it comes down to obedience. It comes down to submission to the Lord. It comes down to bending your self-will to the righteous standards of God. Okay? Now, 8.51. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. See, in the book of Revelation, there's a thing called the second death. It says those that are written in the book of life aren't part of the second death. Okay, because they die once physically, and then they, uh, they go to hell and their spirit burns. It doesn't get annihilated. It burns in hell forever. And, and that's not going to happen if you're saved. That's why it says he shall never see death. To be present, uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, is what Paul said. So it's a powerful thing to never to never see death. So to not be afraid of this, say, well, okay, I'm going to be translated into heaven now, where my mansion's waiting for me. 
to where some loved ones are waiting for me, to where some of the old saints are waiting for me. It's going to be great. And this 58, 858, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. These old Jews knew verily, verily. They knew the double speak. They knew Abraham, Abraham, Moses, Moses. They had those things memorized. And now he's telling them to their face, I am God. Because that's the name of God. And Moses at the burning bush. Jesus is God. It's a sad day in America when the unsaved Jews know what Jesus was saying, but the Christians don't. Okay? Very sad day. You know, they're smarter. These unsaved bad Jews that crucified Christ are smarter than these Catholics and 90% of these uh, Protestants uh, that, that, that twist the word of God and make three gods. Now, John chapter 10. I love John chapter 10. I, I, verse 1. I, I read this many times coming out of the megachurch nine years ago. I read, I read 10 over and over and over, and it just clicked and clicked and clicked about the wolves and the, and the sheep and the door and the shepherd. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. So he's got to come through the door, Jesus, and it says, into the sheepfold. If they don't end up in the sheepfold, a local church, then in the end, they won't be saved. That's part of the scripture. Into the sheepfold. He's the great shepherd. And uh, verse 7, 10, 7. Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Yes, he is. No illegal aliens in the heaven. Got to go through the door. Got to go through Jesus. And uh, there's a lot. In, there's a lot in chapter ten. I really love chapter ten. All right, chapter twelve, verse twenty-four. We've read this many times. Verily, verily, I say to you. Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Jesus also said it like this. He said, you must fall upon the rock, or the, and, or the rock is going to fall on you and grind you to power. So you fall on him for his mercy, because he knows all things. He knows your sin, and you fall upon him. And if you don't, you know, God resists the problem, gives grace and humble. He will fall upon you, and he'll grind you to powder. Absolutely. And you who are saved, you should have much fruit in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Think, think about the parable of the sower. He said, the seed that fell on the good ground bore fruit, some 30, 60, and 100 fold. He didn't say five fold. He didn't say 10 fold. His minimum was 30. So I didn't, I didn't say in the next two years. If you're saved, you should have much fruit over the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I plan on having at least 30 fold, because that's what the Lord said. I don't know if it take 30 or 40 years, but yeah, absolutely. You should believe the same. Six, uh, 13, 16, chapter 13, verse 16. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. These verilies, we're kind of reading them fast, but these are really something that God wanted to emphasize very strongly. You're not greater than Jesus. They hated him, they're going to hate you. Okay? They called him Bezelbub, they're going to call you some devil too. They slandered him, they're going to slander you. They crucified him, they would crucify us if by law they could. They can't do it in America yet, okay? They would. The servant's not greater than his Lord. Jesus is, uh, uh, Jesus is always greater than us. Jesus is greater than Paul. And I love Paul. I quote Paul lots. I love him. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than Ezekiel. Jesus is greater than Moses. Uh, where would we be without the law of God and without Moses? Well, where would we be without Christ and his blood? And who the one who gave Moses the law. Where would we be? And verse 16 kind of has a little side teaching there, the second half. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. He that is sent. Who ordained that person? Who discipled that person? All these fools on YouTube, 
that, that have no accountability and no anything like that. I mean, I know my pastor backslid, became a pope hugger in India, but there was an ordination flow in process, and I believe in that. And it's biblical, and it's Paul sending out Titus and Timothy and everything else like that. It sets pride for someone to think that no one in all of America has a greater revelation than the new baby Christian. Gr greater works. Now, nobody in history, not even a John Wesley, a John Bunyan, none of these guys, Tertullia, none of these guys had greater works or wrote something powerful that they could, that they could learn, learn from. It's such uh, pride. And, you know, to preach the other side of this revelation about being obeyed and sent out, I have no issue if God calls, God calls another man like he does Paul. Okay? In America today, 2023, like he did Paul. But two things are going to be very fruitful in the next five years. That brother is going to be planting churches. <laughs> he had at least have one down by the time he's in five years. He's going to be on fire. And two, he's going to love the brethren. He's not going to let people break the ninth commandment slide. Thou shalt not bear false witness and slander a brother and not defend it. And he's also going to be hated and persecuted, which is why I ask people how many times you've been arrested. How many times you, how many years you've been street preaching? How many times you've been arrested? How many times you've been hit on spit or whatnot? Okay. I lost track. For so many years, okay. The, if he really was called like that, and there would be a, there would be a connection, like Paul and Peter have, and whatnot. But not not these guys with no fruit after five years, and they self ordained trafficking and demonic things. Chapter thirteen, verse twenty. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me. Receiveth him that sent me. So he says, whosoever I send. I, I don't care if they're Indian, if they're Chinese guy, if they're an Iranian Christian, they're from the South, they're from Canada. I don't care. But do they preach the law of God and the testimony of the Lord? To the law, to the testimony, they speak not. They have no light in them. They don't speak those things. You know Isaiah 8, 20. And I know how to test the spirits. Do you? Okay? And 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit. Oh, it troubles him all right when people reject the messenger of God. He's troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say to you that one of you shall betray me. And Jesus was right. Judas did betray him. Jesus is always right. He knew that Judas was not receiving anymore. He knew that Judas wasn't receiving the word coming uh, there. Are, are, you, are you receiving the word of God today? Or are you like a Judas? <laughs> Just listen to what you can get out of it. Well, listen with your heart to what God is trying to speak to you about in your personal life. 37, 38, same chapter. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? What a powerful question. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. And that could be a whole sermon right there. And Jesus was right. God knew the future. God knew the exact thing with the rooster, where it was going to be, how it was going to go down, and he was going to deny him three times. And God knows your specific future. God knows the exact specific future of America. And God is not surprised when these things happen. He is sovereign. The question is, what, 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 what will you do? Don't be like Peter. <laughs> Don't be like Peter. No, no, no. But by the grace of God, I'll die for the Lord. That's the way to say it. I mean, if, if Book of James says it out about business, how much more about martyrdom? And James, he said, you should say, if the Lord wills, tomorrow I'm going to do this in this business, if the Lord wills. That's a, that's a very biblical saying. Well, how much more about martyrdom? Yeah, by the grace of God, go all, all the way. You know, but Peter is like, no, no, by my grace, by my strength, by my power, I'm going to do this. And he's like, well, will you? Will you? Verily, verily. Nope. Chapter 14, verse 12. We've got a few more left. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do... Shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Greater works. Miracle power is still here today. 
Miracle power is still flowing in America today. God is still the healer. God still does greater works today. And it's greater because it's through more people and we get to go to lots of lots of places. Not that we're going to raise, Jesus rose one guy from the dead, Lazarus, or we're going to raise two from the dead. That's not what he's saying. Although, that's fine. I don't have a problem. Hey, Smith Wigglesworth had like eight people raised from the dead. That's great. Okay? But we go longer than three and a half years and there's more of us. That's what he means in the greater works. And we get to, and we're preaching, uh, the, 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 well, we're preaching what he preached, of course, but we're also preaching all the epistles too. The, the, the main thing is there's more of us and it's longer than three and a half years. Chapter 16, verse 20. It says, Now Judas has left the room. Now he gets into heavier meat with the disciples. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your joy, sh but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Ye shall weep, ye shall weep, you will sorrow. And everyone say will. 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 If you have not already sorrowed in your life, uh, you will at some point. And remember these two things. Number one, Jesus also sorrowed. Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was fully, 100 he fully knows your pain. He has actually been through it himself. Been shunned. Been spit on been falsely arrested, been slandered, been he's actually been through it. It's not theory, theory to him or theoretical to him, okay? Empty empathy, it's real empathy. He knows. On the human side, when he was in the flesh, and on the divine side, being God, he knows. And two, your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Your sorrow will be turned into joy. It's going to happen one of three ways. In this life, you're going to see some bad heretic die and it's going to be joyful mm -hmm. okay uh or you won't see it till you go to heaven or both in this life and heaven okay and so your sorrow will be turned into joy that's what jesus said i believe the words of jesus amen chapter 21 uh, excuse me 16 21 verse 21 we're going to get down to the verily verily is in 23 a little context a woman, when she is in uh, travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. See, proof right there that God knows your heart. This is a man describing a woman's labor pain, and afterwards what goes on, God knows all things. He has no feminine spirit in him whatsoever. He just knows females. Okay? So he's Jesus, the God-man. He's describing that perfectly. You can ask any woman about that experience that's had babies. 22. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice. And your joy, no man taketh from you. They try to take it out, beating them and throwing them in jail, crucifying but nobody took that joy. They had what's called the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Yes. So in the day of the resurrection, they're not asking anything. They're just happy. They weren't asking anything. They weren't asking. All, they weren't praying that. They were like, wow, you rose from the dead. Whoa, hugs, bread, eating, revelation, just in total, just like, just, just they weren't asking that day. They didn't pray that day. There's a riddle for you. What day did the disciples not pray? The day he rose from the dead. There's your answer. In that day, you shall ask me nothing. It's true. They didn't that day. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Well, the Father's name is Jesus. Ask. Pray. Ask. Now, ask. Pray. Ask. I have not preached this in a while. Let me tell you. Ask God in prayer. I have no shame to ask God for many, many things. Every day I do. Every morning, lots of revelation, asking for favor, asking for things. I mean, I even couldn't even get this well thing stuck the other day. I had to pull it. It was, it was surrounded by like 20 pounds of, of pebbles through this, through, this, through this 
PVC pipe to the other one. I had to pull it up like two feet to get it off higher, and I couldn't do it. I was stuck, and then everybody's gone. And then Brother Levi's muscles are helping. James living so far away, you know, and helping. Or I wasn't going to call my wife to help, but she was gone anyway. I was like, Lord, can you please help me with this? And I pulled, I was like, this is my last time. I'm going to destroy this thing for like 10 minutes. I'm like, Lord, and then Allison just moves up. I mean, I really pushed with all my strength beforehand. And I pray, hey, I don't have a problem asking. I ask the Lord help me. Fix my will. It was powerful. Happens all the time. God is sovereign. The reason I ask so much with no shame and why you should ask for, you should just ask like all the time in prayer. Kids, I don't care. Pray, pray, pray for a pony right now. Pray for a horse. I tell them, yeah, pray for the dog. Y'all want the dog? Kids, start praying for it. Pray for the dog. Dog might just walk into your house. You might walk in two guineas. might walk up to your house. Hey, somebody prayed for two guineas, and my two guineas ran away, and they got them. <laughs> so, they got, so I'm praying. The reason you can ask all the time with no shame is because God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He's going to know. He's going to give it to you at the time. So you might as well just ask. Okay? We're a holiness church. So we don't have false piety. I have no, no problem asking them business breakthroughs and war revelation breakthroughs and favor and healing. And I just keep asking. Keep asking. Keep asking in faith. John chapter 21. I do miss my guineas though. 2118. I think my girls did pray for another dog. I was like, no, we didn't get a dog for two years. And we got a dog like two weeks later because of a bear. Look at that. How all things work together for good for those little kids that love them. 2118. In closing, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And again, Jesus was right about Peter. This also gives us a, a glimpse into the early life of Peter as a young man being so self-willed, and he walked wherever he wanted to walk. He did what he wanted to do. And um, stretching forth your hands means he was crucified. Jesus Christ told him he was going to be crucified. And Peter, knowing that, still fought the fight of faith and finished the race, knowing that. Would, would you do the same if you knew you were going to be nailed to a cross in 15 years? 20 years, 25 years? The Lord's like, Levi, you're going to be nailed to a cross in 30 years. James, when you're older and you're gray, you're going to be nailed, you have gray beard, you're going to be nailed to a cross in 30 years. You're going to go when you're old. He didn't say, give him, didn't give him a time on when you're old. He says old. He says that. So Peter, knowing Peter, he's like, okay, I'm young, I'm kind of middle-aged. Old means old. I just go for it now. I ain't going to die. <laughs> the Lord said, when I'm old, I'll be crucified. Wow, I'm just going to go extra because I'm not going to die till I'm old. That's the way I think Peter would take it. You know, absolutely. And he did that, and history shows that. It's a powerful thing. And he really did die crucified. And he said, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. Put me upside down. Now everybody says, thinks that's a pietistic thing. I think actually Peter was really smart because if you're upside down, the blood goes to your brain quick and you die really fast. <laughs> it's less painful. So I actually think history lies about Peter being all pietist because it's false piety. He's all over the place. And he's like, I've seen enough of these things. Yeah, yeah, put me upside down. I'm not worthy to be like my Lord. And he dies quick. Smart man. Emulate that. Every head bowed. Everybody praying.